In this video tutorial, we're going to be discussing a specific type of heat exchanger known as an evaporative heat exchanger. Now, all that means is that one of our working fluids is evaporating or changing state rather than changing in temperature. And we'll discuss this in context throughout the tutorial. So once again, we need two working fluids. We need a hot fluid and a cold fluid. And in this example, we're going to be discussing a refrigeration unit. So in this refrigeration unit, we have hot air entering the unit and we have cold air leaving the unit. Therefore, our hot fluid is the air. Now we have the specific heat capacity of the air of 1005 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And we're specifying that we want the temperature of the air to exit the heat exchanger at 4 degrees C. The air entering the heat exchanger is at 22 degrees C, and we don't yet know the mass flow rate of air that can be processed. Our cold fluid then is the refrigerant R410A. Now R410A has a latent heat of vaporization of 274.1 kilojoules per kilogram. Just take care here, this is kilojoules, therefore 274.1 thousand joules per kilogram. Now we're also specifying that the mass flow rate of refrigerant through our heat exchanger is 0.2 kilograms per second. You'll note that we don't have any temperatures for the refrigerant because instead of changing temperature, what we have is refrigerant as a liquid at its evaporation temperature and as that fluid absorbs heat, it begins to turn from liquid to gas. There are other steps in the refrigeration cycle, such as compression and expansion, which would then enable us to restore the refrigerant back to the liquid state in order to continue the cooling process. Now on the right hand side we have our heat transfer formula, and the rate of heat transfer formula states that the rate of heat lost by the hot fluid, lost hence the minus sign, equals the rate of heat gained by the cold fluid. And again because it's rate of heat gained, that's actually going to be a positive value. Now we also have two other formulas for rate of heat transfer. We have the first, mass flow rate times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. But as we've already said, the temperature of our refrigerant isn't going to change, so that formula wouldn't be applicable. Instead, for our refrigerant, we have the mass times the latent heat of vaporization. So we have a change in state rather than a change in temperature. So for our hot fluid or for our air, we need to use the first of these two formulas, MCP delta T. Again, we need to apply the minus sign. Now the first unknown in that formula is actually the mass flow rate of the air. That's the thing that we're trying to find in the first instance. We know the specific heat capacity of the air is 1005. And we also have our changes in temperature for the air. T2 is 4 and T1 is 22 degrees C. On our right hand side then for our cold fluid, we're using the second of those two formulas. We have the mass flow rate of the refrigerant times the latent heat of vaporization for the refrigerant. So we have 0.2 times the latent heat of vaporization, 271.4. But as we said before, that's kilojoules per kilogram. So we need to remember to multiply that value by a thousand to get joules or our SI units. Okay, so let's simplify this. First of all, if we do 1005 times 4 minus 22, we're going to come out with a negative number. And that number is going to be minus 18,090. But what we can do is apply the negative sign on the outside to make that positive 18,090. So our left hand side is going to become positive 18,090 multiplied by our unknown mass flow rate of air. Simplifying our right hand side, we get 54,820. So what we know from this is that the rate of heat transfer to our cold fluid or to our refrigerant is 54.8 kilowatts. Now, because we're assuming this heat exchanger is 100% efficient or 100% effective, we therefore know that our left hand side must equal 54,820 because all of the heat energy that's leaving our hot fluid is being gained by our cold fluid. So next we can calculate the mass flow rate of our air by dividing each side by 18,090. So we get 54,820 divided by 18,090 which gives us 
3.03 kilograms per second accurate to two decimal places. Therefore, our refrigeration unit is capable of processing 3.03 kilograms per second of air. So next we're going to change a couple of parameters. And what we're going to say is that at full capacity, our refrigeration unit can actually handle more than 0.2 kilograms per second of refrigerant. And in doing so, we're going to see what the maximum inlet temperature of the air is in order to still achieve our desired outlet temperature of 4 degrees C. So let's adjust those parameters and clear some space now. OK, so for our hot fluid, we're keeping the mass flow rate of air that can be processed the same as 3.03 .03 kilograms per second, and that's the value that we just calculated. And we're also fixing the outlet temperature of the air. That's our desired outlet air temperature from the heat exchanger. But what we're saying is that this refrigeration unit can actually handle a greater mass flow rate of refrigerant, and we've specified that it can handle 0.25 kilograms per second. Our unknown then is the maximum inlet temperature of air into our refrigeration unit, and we're going to calculate that now. So the left hand side of our equation is as follows. We need to remember the minus sign on the outside because the hot fluid is losing energy. We have the mass flow rate of air, 3.03. .03. We have the specific heat capacity of air, 1005. And we have our outlet temperature of the air of 4 degrees C. What we don't yet know is the inlet temperature of our air, T1. That's our unknown this time. On the right hand side for our cold fluid, we know the mass flow rate passing through the heat exchanger has now been increased to 0.25 kilograms per second. And we know our latent heat of vaporization is 274.1. But as mentioned before, that's kilojoules. So we need to multiply that by 1000 in order to get joules per kilogram. So once again, we can simplify this. So multiplying out our left hand side, we have 3.03 .03 times 1005, but that's actually going to give us a negative value if we take account of the minus sign outside the brackets. So we have minus 3045.15 times 4 minus T1 equals 68,525. Note that this value is slightly higher than the previous example because we actually have more heat energy transferring to our refrigerant every second. So next then, because we want to get T1 on its own, we need to isolate this bracket. And the way that we're going to isolate this bracket is by dividing each side by minus 3045.15. So that's going to give us the following 4 minus T1 equals 68,525 over minus 3045.15, which equals minus 22.50, accurate to two decimal places. Let's just write this on the next line. We have 4 minus T1 equals minus 22.50. OK, so the next step then is to minus 4 from each side. And if we minus 4 from each side, we're going to get minus T1. Don't forget to include the minus sign. Equals minus 26.50. And the final step then, we can change sign because we have a minus number on the left hand side and we have a minus number on the right hand side. Changing the sign of the left and right hand side leaves us with T1 equals 26.50 degrees C. So what we've shown here is that when our refrigeration unit is working at maximum capacity and processing 0.25 kilograms per second of refrigerant, the inlet temperature can actually rise from 22 degrees C to 26.50 degrees C. And as you would expect, if we're trying to achieve a set outlet temperature for our air, if the inlet temperature increases, we need to increase the rate of heat transfer away from the air.